So let's begin the lecture for today. You remember we said correlation is a statistic that falls between negative one and positive one. And we can establish a relationship between many variables. And that the strength of the correlation is determined by the absolute value and not the sign. I hope you remember. Now, we are, all this while we are using the data set, which is a broker to ventures data set. This data set has some numerical as well as these categorical variables. And in order to do correlation matrix, you have to convert in Excel. If you want to do correlation matrix in Excel, you have to convert these dummy variables and code them into numbers. You have to encode them into numbers. And I quite remember you, remember we had the Excel sheet that has the coded version as well as the encoded version. I hope you remember. The coded version. Okay. All right. So what we are going to do now is I want to demonstrate with you, and I'm not going to delay much on this because I, the video is there and I also expect that you are able to do it by yourself. I want to show you the coded version in Excel. And right now I am showing you the coded Excel data. So you can see that for location, I've coded it, occupation, I've coded it for two of them because there were three levels. So the dummies are two. Religion, there were three levels. So the dummies are two. I want to believe you see my screen, do you? No, no, Prof. Yes, yes, Doc. Yes, I can see. I can see. We can see. Yes, I can see. You see the Excel, right? Yes, please. All right, okay. Yes, yes. So this Excel, we are going to use it, and then we'll later use the uncoded as well, because the uncoded is really acceptable in the, in the mind of R. Okay, so let's start with the coded. The coded, we are going to do it just in Excel. So it's, we are just generating a correlation matrix. Remember, a correlation matrix shows the interrelationship among multiple variables. So we are just going to look at the correlation between quantity demanded of gene vectors and price. The correlation between quantity demanded of gene vectors and complement price and income and location and occupation and religion and also among themselves as well. Okay. So let's generate the correlation with this. The first thing you do is go to the data tab on the top right, on the top of your screen. And then on the far right, you click on data analysis. And then in the pop-up that follows, you select. Remember the last time we selected descriptive statistics? Now you're going to select correlation. Double click on correlation. The correlation parameter dialog box will show. And there's a section where you have to input the input range. So the input range includes all the data sets together with their headings. So let's highlight everything, drag it all the way down and drag it to cover the entire data set. If you exceed it left or right, bottom or right, you make sure you come back. Once you have selected, and this will be collected in cell A1 to I41. 
take labels in first row. Tick labels in first row. Then click on the output range. The output range requires that you are just going to select where you want the results to be. So click on the white space to the right of the output range. And just make sure that you select a cell to the right of the last column. The last column is Rn. So the cell to the right is G1. Done. You are ready to click OK. And a beautiful correlation matrix has just been generated beautifully for you. You can see that a correlation matrix is highlighted gray, which means that you can adjust it slightly. How can you adjust it? Well, there are so many decimals, so we can convert it to two decimals. How? Go to the Home tab, and then you see General under Help. You see General. Click on the little arrow to the right of General, and in the drop down, select number. When you select number, everything will be in two decimal places. Yes, Venice. Yes, Prof. Um, I tried, I tried um, getting it, but I think my out, output range, I know you said we should click outside the white areas, but when I did, I'm not getting the correlation uh, matrix. When I did what? When I I click outside to get the done. Okay, the matrix, the correlation matrix, like like you, you click, have had. Uh, you killed. You click the cell to the right of the RM column. You did that. Did you click for the input? I selected all the data, and then I clicked on labels in the first row oh, and for the out, output range. Yes. I said, did you so select the to the right of the out of the RM. That's what I'm asking. Yes, please. So, which cell number did and you say? Select? J J J one. Good. So you selected J one and you clicked OK and nothing showed, isn't it? Yes, please. And the reason is because you whatever you did in the input range it was deleted. So you're supposed mm. to delete whatever is in the input range and re-copy or re-highlight and drag and copy okay. them back into the input range. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. All right, and don't forget to also take the labels in first row. Okay, please. All right, so once you get this, we can answer some questions. We need to understand what this correlation matrix implies. So I'm gonna go back to the slide. And then we are going to answer some questions related to this correlation matrix. But I will expect that you are able to generate the correlation matrix by yourself. I'm not going to delay and teach everybody how to generate it, but I expect that you are able to do it by yourself. Okay. Now, let's go to the correlation matrix that we have just generated. So on the basis of this, I can ask you to tell me some few things. Who can tell me, just looking at the matrix, who can tell me the correlation coefficient between price and income? Between price and income. Who can tell me? Uh, that's oh. zero, negative, negative zero point. Five one. Negative zero point five one. This is the one he's talking about. Yes. Right. That is correct. What he did was that he mapped the P and then mapped the M, and then he was able to get the results that he got. Okay. Who can also tell me the correlation coefficient between LU and M, L, U, and M. What is the correlation matrix between L, U, and M? Can tell us. It appears that it's not generated. Everything is L, U, 0 0.18. 0 0.18. 
So L U and M. You see, if you go and do L U here and M, mm. you will say that nothing is generated. Yeah. You should also know that L U is here and then M is there. Okay. So as long as you have a mirror image, everything on the empty space is reflected on the written space. That's our correlation matrices. Everything is there. So sometimes when you find it in the empty space here, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It's still there. Just look at the mirror image of that and you see it here. So for example, this value had an empty space here. And because it had an empty space, its mirror image is here. And that is how we had a point one eight. Okay, now that you understand this, let's get to the real correlations. Let's understand correlations better. So the first thing I want you to find is identify three pairs of variables, and you might want to write these things. Okay. Identify three pairs of variables that are highly correlated with the dependent variable. Three pairs of variables that are highly correlated with the dependent variable. Another name for the dependent variable is Another name for the dependent variable is a response variable, response. So a dependent variable is also called response, response variable. Prof, please, is it the same as the outcome variable? All right. So you have to, first of all, identify which variable here is the dependent variable. Who can tell us? Based on the storyline and based on what you see here. Prof Q. It's Q. As quantity. Q. Remember, the thesis was trying to look at the determinant of quantity demanded of gene bakers. So on our column here, we have Q. So we have to focus on that Q column. And now the question says, which variables are highly correlated with this Q. Now remember, when the value of the coefficient is one, like all the numbers you see here, we don't say they are highly correlated. Rather, we say they are perfectly correlated. So what is the difference between highly correlated and perfectly correlated variables? Highly correlated is closer to one, but it's not one. Perfectly correlated is exactly one. I'm sure you got that. So all those values that are perfectly correlated, for example, Q, 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 and kill with a value of one, that is perfectly correlated. Who can tell me another pair that is perfectly correlated? P and P. P, and P. And you always have to write a value in the middle, in the bracket. What else apart from P and P? Q, C, R, and Q. No, no, no. Watch the way I indicated my own. I said Q and Q into bracket one. Follow the pattern. Someone said P and P. That is fine. What else? You always have to let the coefficients guide you. Yes? C and C. C and C. Good. What else? M and M. Good. What else? L U and L U. 
Bibles are perfectly connected. See what else, what else, so that you guys who are not getting it can get it. Okay. So you should follow the pattern that your colleagues are saying. So anytime the coefficient is one, you will see that the variable is correlated with itself. That's what it means. It's correlated with itself. Okay. Now let's go to variables that are highly correlated with the dependent variable Q. Which, is, which variable would you say is highly? It looks like we can't see the screen. It's your network, please. I, well, I, I, can. I, I, it, it might be your network, I can see. It's your network. If you can't see the screen, okay. it's your network, please. And that is also good why you should have your own Excel generated data so that you are following from your end. All right. So the most highly correlated variable with the dependent variable Q is which variable? And tell me why you chose that variable. Who can tell me? Or like of Dennis Price. Like his price. Your hands. Okay, so that we don't have a multiplicity of talks going on. Raise your hand for me so that I can use that to identify those who will have to talk. Uh, Dennis. Yes, Prof. P is highly, most highly related, correlated to the dependent variable Q. I chose P because it is um, 0 0.87. That means it's more closer to one. Okay. Even though you said it, you did not bring the negative and it's important you bring the negative. So say it again. It's P is highly close to the dependent variable, the dependable, the dependent variable Q, because it is having a, a value of negative zero point eight seven. Our end value, we also call it coefficient. Coefficient. Good. So the way you will write it is this: you write it as Q and P. That's how you write it. Then you put into brackets negative 0 0.87 okay, to signify the fact that it is the most highly correlated. But I said three pairs. So you just identify the first pair. Which is the second pair? Who can tell us? Of course, you must have your reason before selecting the pair. Who can tell us a second pair? Let's go to Martin. So the second pair is Q and OTR into brackets, negative 0 0.78. Very good. Q and OTR okay, into brackets, negative 0 0.78. So these coefficients are your guidance. Fantastic. Who can tell us a third pair? The third pair. Uh, Felix. Yeah. Q and RM into bracket negative 0 0.76. Q and RM okay. into bracket negative 0 0.76. Very good. So at this stage, you should be able to know variables that are highly correlated. And when they say highly correlated, you just have to list them from the highest to the lowest. So if I say the top three, you list the highest from the top three. Okay, who can tell me two pairs of variables, two, not three, that are least correlated with the dependent variable? Least correlated with the dependent variable. See the way I've turned the question around. This time I'm not asking you to turn the highest, but this time it is correlated with the dependent variable. Let's give it to Asan. Yeah, um, Q and OT into bracket negative 0 0.11. Q and OT. And then negative 0. Point one one. That's correct because that is the smallest value. Next, which is the next? 
Martin. Martin. Sorry, sir. Q and M zero point six one. Q and M zero point six one is also correct. That is the next lower. Okay, after the zero negative zero point one one. So you should be able to identify the highest and the lowest all the time. Okay. So what I just said, I was very specific. I said two or three pairs of variables highly correlated with the dependent variable. So I was very specific with which variable, the dependent variable. Oh, by the way, note that the dependent variable is always the first column after the variable column. It's always this column. The, the, if we are to go by strictly, we say the second column is always in the second column. So take note that the second column should always be your dependent variable. Okay. Now let's take it a little bit further. Let's identify rather three pairs of variables that are highly multicollinear. I'll explain how multicollinear. We'll come to that specifically when we come to the assumptions of regression. Three pairs of variables that are highly multicollinear. Collinear. What do we mean by multicollinearity? You might want to write this down, okay? Because I understand it to the extent that I can tell you to. Um, write it down. Multicollinearity exists when two independent variables are so highly correlated that written that multicollinearity exists when two independent variables are so highly correlated that. It becomes hard or difficult. They are so highly correlated that it becomes hard or difficult to disentangle the partial effect. It becomes hard are uh, difficult to disentangle the partial effect of one from the other, of one from the other on the dependent variable. So multicollinearity exists when two independent variables are so highly correlated that it becomes difficult to separate the partial effects of one from the other on the dependent variable. So there's a first criteria that you should know when it comes to multicollinearity. The first is that the two variables that are multicollinear must be independent variables. That was key in the definition, independent variables, IV. And these two variables that are both independent variables, each one is trying to influence the behavior of the dependent variable. Each is trying to throw some kind of influence, impact. So the behavior of this independent variable may be associated with the behavior of the dependent variable. But in the process of that association, another variable is, is interrupting it. I'll give you two examples. Imagine that your partner has stolen some money in the company. But in reality, he didn't steal the money. 
but all indications looked like he did. So the matter was taken to high court and the prosecutor asked your partner that on the 24th of December, around 12 noon, so you are, you, you are being asked, you are being asked that around 12 noon, you didn't, it's your partner that, has, that is purported to have stolen the money. And you are being asked that, were you with your husband on the afternoon of the theft? Now, the answer you will give may be taken into account strongly to determine whether you will be acquitted and discharged. But you are a partner. So the likelihood of you saying yes is high. Why do you think that the likelihood of you saying yes is high? Mm -hmm. Because the two of you yeah. are multicollinear. Yeah. You see, the two of you are so highly correlated that it's difficult to disentangle the two of you so the likelihood of you repeating what your spouse will say is high. Now, so let's say that you say that, oh, I was with my husband, or I was with my wife the whole of that afternoon till the evening of the 24th of December. When you make that statement, why is it that the jury is not going to be surprised? They will not be surprised much because after all, the two of you are highly multicollinear. That is what we mean, that you move together. When two variables are like that, the one way you might think or assume that they are multicollinear is come and check their correlation coefficient. And if it is high, so high, then it means those independent variables are multi highly. Remember, the Q or the dependent variable is not part of those that are multi -collinear. Another example, imagine that your employer, in your company, you've been observing that people are sent to do their PhD, and whenever they return after three to five years, their salaries are doubled. You have seen that multiple times in your company. And you are quite getting angry because you have been in this company for, for some time. In fact, you've been in the company for three years. So because you were not happy, you went to your boss and you started complaining that why is it that I have been here and, and, and people keep going and coming and I have not been given the opportunity to go do my PhD. And your boss says, oh, sorry. Maybe you didn't read it in the employee document. It says that once you have been with a company for five years, you will be given a free scholarship to do your PhD. And upon your return, your salary will be doubled. Now that your boss has told you this, you become happy. Why? Because you know you have how many years left? How many years? Three years more. How many? Three. No, you don't have three years. I have two years. Have You've two been there years three years. More. So you have two years more. So you have two years. Now imagine the two years come and you actually go get a scholarship, you go do your PhD and now point of return, truly you are, your salary is doubled. My question to you is that, was the increase in your salary as a result of the five years experience you had in the company or it was as a result of the four year PhD you had, which one? The increase in your salary, was it precipitated by the 
five years experience or four years education? Who can tell me? Which one? Yes, Niyama. I think I think you should be both because if you've not attained the five years, you won't get the scholarship to go study. And if you've not studied the PhD, your salary will also not be increased. But if it's both variables that will determine whether your salary will be increased or not. Mm. Okay, let's go to Anaba. Yeah, I don't. I believe both both variables influence the doubling of your salary. Okay, but if you Asana, what would yeah. you say? Yeah, I also think both influence it because if you were not employed there, you wouldn't have even had a chance to do the scholarship in the first place. So they are both dependent on. So in this case, we will say that education and experience are what? Multicollinear. Multicollinear. When two variables are highly correlated like that, we say they are multicollinear. Now, it's not a good thing because what, what is going to happen is that you are not able to really attribute the impact to one of them because one of them is influenced by the other before the other can influence the other. And so multicollinearity is a, a, a kind of a, an issue in a regression. And in this course, you are going to see how you can detect it and how you can handle it. How to detect and how to address it. So now, what are the ways you, there are ways to detect, but one way you can detect that two variables may be multicollinear is by checking the values of the correlation coefficient. Now, some authors say that when the correlation coefficient is above 0.5, then they are multicollinear. Some say if it is above 0.8, then it's multicollinear. Some say if it is above 0.9, so it depends. Okay. But I am giving you a question here that which top three variables may be multicollinear? Top three pairs of variables may be multicollinear. Of course, using their correlation coefficient. Who can tell me the first pair? I haven't honestly checked by yourself. Felix. Felix. Yes, Felix. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OTR 0.76. Again. P and OTR 0.76. Okay. So he says this value 0 0.76. Okay. Next one. Who can give us? Hello. Yeah. No P and C. I have not called you. So hold on. Uh, the one who spoke, I have not called you. So hold on. Hold on. Okay. Okay, Doug. Um, yes, Mary. Mary, which one is the next pair? M and RM is negative 0 0.73. Negative 0 0.73. This one is the one you chose. I will not buy that. <laughs> I think something comes before that. Don't worry. Don't change it. Let another person come in. We don't want to be doing repetitions. We want so to bring the. So please mute yourself. Those of you who are not talking. Let's go to another person who can tell me the second pair. Because the second pair Mary gave us is not correct. So who can give us a second pair? Okay, so I think what I have to do is I should mute everybody. I'm going to mute everybody. Then when you raise your hand, I can actually call you. So let me go to Benis. Ofosu. 
Ben is your uh, unmuted. Yes, sir. Thank you. So P and C into bracket 0 0.74. P and C is the next higher one. Exactly. Okay. Because P and C is higher than, I mean, negative 0 0.74 is higher than negative 0.73. Negative 0.73 actually is the third pair. Is the third pair. So the way you would have written the first pair is P and OTR. And then you put into bracket 0 0.76, 0 0.76. And then the others can be written equally like that. So that is how you identify the top three. I could have said the top four, the top five, highly multicollinear. Now who can give me the three least, least multicollinear pairs? Who can give me all the three least multicollinear pairs? Three least multicollinear pairs. And I mean, give me all the three. So that means you should find all the three in your mind or on your paper. Then you raise your hand and then you can share it with us. List multicollinear pair. Three of them. Three list multicollinear pair. Dennis, let's give it to Dennis. Um, Prof, I, I think I didn't lower my hand. Um... Okay. When I so three least multicollinear pair. Let me go to Kenneth. Kenneth, can you give us an answer? Yes, Ken. Yes, Doc. O T and the first one is O T and M. What value? She's negative, negative 0 0.03. Again, what number? Negative 0 0.03. Negative 0 0.03. This is a value that gentleman just spoke about. Okay, go with the next one. The next one is R, C, and O, T. Mm -hmm. Negative 0 0.05. This is Sorry, 0 0.05. Talk about, uh-huh. And the last one? The last one is OT and Q, negative 0 0.11. Okay, this is the one he spoke about, but that last one is wrong. Okay, so let another person tell us why that was wrong and which is a correct one. Who can tell us why, why that one was wrong and which is a correct one? George. Why was the last one he spoke about wrong? And this is a correct one rather. Because if, if you have been following the trend, oh, George, it looks like, okay, George, click on mute. Unmute yourself and then listen. Is George there? Choose on mute by yourself and let me know. Okay, the technology is not helping George. Let's go to another person. Um, Dennis, let me try for us. Oh, can you hear me, sir? All right. Okay. Um, the OT and Q is wrong because it was between the independent variable and then the dependent variable. That was why it is wrong. So I think the right answer is between LU and M, which is 0 0.18. Okay. He says it is between this and that, and I can see that that is also wrong. So who can give us another better way of handling it? It's good. But he's just going to show you that you need to pay attention all the time when you are handling these things. It's not that 
you know, simple. You need to learn it. James, can you crack it? Yeah, dog. L U N C 0.14. That is the correct one. So the correct one is L U N C, which is 0 0.14. Okay. So, so you can see that the 0 0.18 was a bit too far. You've gone ahead. We just wanted three. And the next one is 0 0.14. Okay. So remember, multicollinear deals with independent variables. So even though the negative 0 0.11 was smaller, it was not smaller enough because it was not good because it was under a dependent variable. And any number here under the dependent variable is not counted as part of our analysis. Okay, now let me give you the very last one under this. Okay. I want you to tell me three pairs of variables that are highly correlated. And watch the choice of words I'm using. Three pairs of variables that are highly correlated. Who can give me the first, second, and third pairs? Three pairs of variables that are highly correlated. And before you give me the answer, you tell us why this question, what makes this one different from the previous one? What makes this different from the previous one? George, unmute yourself and let me see. What makes this different from the, the previous question? Who can tell us? Okay. Who can tell us what makes this? Yes, three pairs of variables that are highly multi. Polinia. Martin, tell them. Three pairs. Yeah, the first one is um, P and C, sorry, P and OTR. What is the value? And also, what is the value? Uh, 0 .0 0 0.76. Okay. We have C and M. Okay. Three pairs of variables that are highly correlated. It says the first pair is 0 0.76. Okay. So I can tell you that that is wrong. Three pairs of variables that are highly correlated. I can tell you that that is wrong. Who can explain why that is wrong? Of course, not to you, Martin. <laughs> Who can explain why that is wrong? It is wrong because, okay, let's go to Asan. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's wrong because right now we want to check the values that are highly correlated, not uh, multicollinearity. So I think the Q are dependent variable to its path, which is exactly. 8, 8, 7. Perfect answer. That's it. You are the, among those who are really following me. Okay. So the correlated includes both dependent and independent variables. And it's important to recognize that, okay, that it is not just identified. And you have to start from the highest one. And the highest one here is what? If the dependent and independent variables are part of it, the highest one is what? You can tell me what will be the highest one. Let's start with Felix. Okay, the highest one is Q and P, negative 0 0.87. Exactly. Then the next one, Q and OTR, negative 0 0.78. Good. Then the third one is Q and RM, negative 0 0.76. So the negative 0 0.76, there are two of them. And any one of them, it falls within the criteria. So whether you choose a, the one with the RM or you choose the one with the OTR, once they are both 0.76, either of them is fine. This is correlation. 
and you want to understand that. Let's go to Martin. Martin, you have a question. Yeah, Martin. I just didn't put my, I just didn't put my hands down. That's why. All right. Check. So that is how you address this correlation. So remember that this correlation we just looked at. We need to address it. Okay, whether those three pairs we selected, or maybe more, okay, whether they are a problem or they are not a problem. We will return to that when we enter into the world of multicollinearity and the regression. For now, these are under um, correlation. And so you want to know that. Okay, let's move on now. So all the things we asked, all the questions and answers, you can go through them and verify it among yourself. And of course, you should also go and note that you, you could identify the least correlated. Okay. You could identify the least correlated apart from the most correlated. How do you generate correlation in R? The correlation that we've just done, we did it in Excel, actually. The Excel one looks beautiful, actually. But how do you do it in R? Well, in R, uh, Benis, you have a question. So ask your question, Benis. Okay, Prof. So just a quick one. Um, looking on your slide, I, I realized that there, there was this question on um, the least multicollinearity. Which one is the least? When, when you have um, such... Um, Questions: Do you look at the direction of 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 the value, or is just the value that you look at to detect yes, that? Focus on the absolute value, but when you are writing, you write the minus. That's why. Yeah, I hope you understand. Focus on the absolute value. All right, so. Now, how do you generate the correlation matrix? You can use the Excel, the coded data, and use this command in R to generate it. But if you use the uncoded data, uncoded, that is the data with Excel, um, with English names, with religious names, with occupational names, location names. If you use that data, this third bullet will require that you remove the, the categorical variables before you run them. It's very important. So let me try and see if I can do both for you. Let me go to the Excel. Okay. Let me go to the Excel and then follow me here. So when you look on the screen, you will notice the Excel and the data I'm showing is the coded data. You can highlight the entire data. Okay. Go to R and then load the data. So let's go to R and then load the data. So at this stage, you want to open your R in R Studio, which I know you've done. Just give the name to the data. We call the data gene. If you had it from the last time, you, can, you don't have to type it again. But I'm I'm, I'm typing a command that will bring the data into the memory of R. I'm using the clipboard command, which is read dot the limb okay, into bracket clipboard. So this command, and I've called the name of the data gene. So this is it. Okay. I have copied the data onto my cursor. So it's on the clipboard. So once I click control enter, the data is loaded. Once I click Control Enter, the data will be loaded. And once the data is loaded, the case moves to number two. Now, once you highlight the name of the data, J I N J, once you do that and run just the name alone, the data will be shown at the bottom, which is what you are seeing here. Okay. The data will be shown at the bottom. Now, the part of the reason why this data is showing many things is, is because so many things were copied. That's all. Okay. When so many things are copied. So I'm just going to copy only 
the, the correct information. So I'm just gonna correct, copy the correct information. So I'm gonna run the entire data again. I put my cursor on number one, I run it and then go and show the gene, highlight only the gene and run that gene alone. And you can see that the entire data set is nicely shown here. Okay, remember all of them are numbers, they have been coded. Okay, now since they are numbers and they have been coded, what it means is that you can generate correlation matrix, just like you did in Excel. How do you do that? Just type call. Where is my okay. Just type call is C O R call into bracket gin, the name of the data. Okay. That's it. And and if it is not, if you are not using the coded all numbers and you are using some of them with English letters, it will not work. Okay, once you do this and you run, okay, let's run it. You can see at the bottom that the entire correlation matrix has been generated for me. The decimals are so many. So let's just make it to like two decimal places. How do you do that? Bring round in front of the call. So bring round, then bracket, then after the call gene, bring a comma and write two. Okay. So in other words, we are rounding it to two decimal places. Let's enter and run it and see. Okay. And once you did that, look at the bottom, the data is now in two decimal places at the bottom. I hope you guys can see. Are you following me? Okay, 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 okay. I think uh, because I have I've muted you okay. let me unmute all of you i pray that you are able to mute yourself when you are not talking i hope you guys can see what i'm showing class rep me yes bro yes, yes, sir. yes bro yes we can i see all right now we have been able to generate a correlation which is using the coded data okay you can create something known as cataplot matrix of the variables. So instead of a numbers that shows, you can see at the top, you are showing the variables against the, the same variables. Okay. Instead of that, you can rather show a graph of the variables against a graph of the variables. And this is known as cataplot matrix. How do you do that? Using the coded data, you can still type pairs. You can type pairs, okay, and inside the pairs, you write the name of the data. The name is Jane, so let's type Jane. Then you bring comma and type color, C-O-L, okay, equal to, then you give a color name, you put it in a double apostrophe. Let's give a color of red. You can give a color of green. You can give a color of blue. You can give a color of yellow. Let's call it red. The moment you type red, the color red will be shown if you are using the latest um, RStudio. And then you can run it. When you run it, remember that the plot is gonna show under your plot section here. So you have to give it some space. Once you click run, a beautiful scatter plot matrix will be shown. Look at the bottom right of the, my screen. A scatter plot matrix is just telling you the relationship between each variable, just like we had in the correlation matrix. But in the correlation matrix, is just showing you the numbers, cool. But the scatter plot is showing you the graph, cool. Okay. And so the first variable, how do you read it? Let me show you how you read the scatter plot matrix. You can see this variable here. Okay. Let me see if I can show you. This variable here. Is it showing? No, it's not. So when you look at this variable on the left here, it is a correlation between the Q and then the P. Okay. The first color. 
And if you look at the scatter plot very well, it's showing a negative relationship between price and quantity demanded. I hope you can spot that. If you have changed the coloring to be blue, okay, suppose we have used blue instead of this red, okay, the blue scatter plot matrix will be showing, as you can see here. And it will tell you the relationship. Now, scatter plot matrix among dummy variables, the categorical variables, which ones? I'm talking about those that are the LU, OT, OTR, RM. Those variables, they are, yes, Martin. So you mentioned uh, the relationship between um, Q and P was inverse on the basis of the, on, of the plot, but I, I, I'm wondering how uh, plot, if you sure. can explain how. My cancer is yeah. It's negative because look at the, the, the plot. As one is going down, it's, it's downward sloping. So if the axis, the y axis is Q, and then the horizontal axis is P, you can see that as you are moving along the curve from left to right, the y-axis value is falling whilst the x-axis value is rising. Believe you me, it's so obvious because the last time we looked at scatter plot, the correlation matrix showing some pictures, it was there. Let me just see if I can, if I can zoom in for you. Okay, let me just zoom in a little. Do you see the zoomed out, zoomed in one? No. Let me see if I can show you. I'm zooming in with one here. Do you see? Do you see the zoomed in one? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. Yes. If this is P, if the top one here is P and this one is Q, okay, as you are moving along the curve, P is falling, Q is rising. Uh -huh. Yes. Exactly. So that shows that there's a negative relationship between price and quantity demanded. However, right, when you look at this second one, I will give you this as an example for you to do in data visualization and analysis. So you have to pay attention. If you look at the next one I've circled, okay, this, this other one that I have circled here, you will notice that the relationship, that one is reflecting the kill against the C. <clears throat> that one is reflecting the Q against the C. And when you look at that, you can see that the relationship is positive, generally speaking, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Because so it means that as a complement price, the C is complement price of the good. So as a complement price of the good is increasing, the demand for the good is also increasing. That is it. So the scatter plot can give you a picturesque understanding of the data. But I was going to say that those that are dummy variables, they will normally be seated more on the horizontal and vertical axis. They'll be sleeping at the edges. So those ones, we tend to say that there is no relationship. There is no relationship between them. So most of the ones here, there is no relationship because it's like the scatter plot are on the edges. They are on the edges of the y-axis or on the edges of the x-axis. They are not inside. And so we tend to say they are, they are, there's no relationship. So what are the various relationships you can observe? Basically, you can observe a positive relationship. You can observe a negative relationship. And then you can observe a neutral or no relationship. These are the main ones. So take note. Really, really take note. Now let's go back to our estimation. Any questions so far? All right. So we've been able to use the coded data to generate our correlation matrix. However, in most cases in this course, you'll be using data that is not coded. There are some English letters, the one that have English names. 
like under the location, you have the rural and urban, rural and urban, rural and urban. Okay. In that case, how do you do? So I'm going to rather load that data into the memory of the R. Okay. So when you go to your Excel, yes, Ben, is your question? Yes, Prof. Uh, Prof, please, when we're looking at the Excel data, we re I realized that we could see some exact um, numbers for the relationship between the two um, variables. But in this um, graph, I can see uh, more or less like a scatter, whatever. Are you, are you able to like analyze such that you can see exact value between um, like either P and Q, just no. like we did in the Excel? So that's why you have to generate both. You have to use both the graph as well as the numbers to guide you. Okay. So what okay. the graph is so the doing- Excel will give you the numbers and then the I will give you, you the- both. Excel can oh, okay. give you both the graph and the oh, numbers. Okay. We show okay. the numbers, we show the graph. But, oh, sorry, sorry, Excel, will give you only the numbers, but cannot give you the graph. R can give you all. Okay. Yes. I normally don't use the Excel, but for your purpose, that's why I'm using the Excel, just so that you guys will be happy of it. Thank you, sir, I appreciate it. So now let's copy this data. Remember this data has got English letters. So let's copy this data into the memory of R. I'm going to use the same name, Jim. So Control C will highlight the data. Control A will highlight the data. Control C will copy it. Then once you copy the data, you take it to the R Studio. I'm going to use Command One to run the data, and I'll show it. So I've just run the data at the bottom of the console. It is saying I've run it. Then use Jim. Highlight only the Jim, and then after highlighting the Jim. You run only the gene. Okay. Daniel, I hope you are with us okay, because you're interrupting. And then once you run the gene, this is what you get, just the gene. You can see that the entire data set is shown down here in the console, nicely shown, this time with the categorical variables. Okay, so now that you have categorical variables, what do you do? Well, if you are generating correlation matrix, you cannot do it nicely using the categorical variables. Okay. The only thing you can do is to remove the categories. That's it. Okay. And you can remove the categories using this command. I don't want to type that command. I've just copied and pasted here. The command is col gen comma minus which name. So you are telling R that I want you, the minus means I want you to remove some names inside the gene data set. And what are the names? They are location, LOC, occupation, OCC, and religion, REL. So those columns, which are here, actually, those columns which are here, all of them are going to be removed before the correlation matrix can be generated. Okay. You can type round, you can put a round, okay, behind it, and then after this, you can put comma two, so that everything will be given in two decimal places. Once you do that, look at the bottom here. You can see that all the categorical variables have been removed, and then you have two decimal places, you have your entire correlation matrix. This time, it is only on the numerical variables. Okay. So depending on which, kind of question you're answering, it may be, it's important for you to know both the using the, the coded data or using the uncoded data. Okay, all right. Now let's go to um, another set of important information you should do. And that is correlation with p-values. And this time I'm not going to use the coded Downcoded. The one I just loaded now. Guys, you see me toggling between the two data sets. That's why you all have the two data sets. 
So what I'm about to do now, I'm going to rather use the coded. So I'm coming here to the first command and load the coded. Okay, I'm running that and I'm showing that at the bottom. I've loaded that. Let me show that at the bottom. So you can see that now, um, now you are seeing the coded data at the bottom here. And I'm going to generate a correlation matrix, but with P values. Okay, with P values. Now, what do we mean? You can tell me that the correlation between Q and P is negative 0.87 degree. Um, negative 0.87, the coefficient is negative, which means it's highly correlated. And the question is, is that correlation significant? So generating a correlation with p-values is good. Why is it good? Because it will help you to know whether the correlation is significant or not. That's all. But how can you generate it? You need a certain package. The package is a library, Okay, into bracket H miscellaneous. Come on. So library into bracket H M I S. And if that H miscellaneous is already installed, once you start running it, it will show. Once you start typing it, it will show. So I'm going to invoke this library. Let's do in the by running it. So I just did that. And at the bottom, okay, it will give some time to load it. Okay. Good. So the date is been loaded. So now I can run my correlation with p-values. How do you generate correlation matrix with p-values? Well, you have to type R core into bracket, and then you type as dot matrix. R call as dot matrix. Okay. Once you do as dot matrix, then you type. Then you type the name of your data into the bracket, and the name of the data is Jane, the one I just loaded. So I'm just doing that. And let's see, this is gonna give you the Pearson correlation with P values. Look at the bottom, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. How you read it is the important thing. All the information at the top part of the data, I'll just show you properly. The information at the top part of the data are the correlations. So the information at the top part of the data That is what we mean by the correlations. So the correlations are these ones. And you can see that N is equal to four, which means that the observations are 40. Then the p-values are the ones directly below it. Okay. But the question is, how do you read the p-values? This is how you read the p-values. Once you pick an information here, I just take, once you pick a value, um, here, let's say that you want to look at the relationship between price and quantity, and the value is this. Okay, you see where I've just put a star. Then you match that up with this value. That is showing the relationship between P and Q. And that is a P value, and the P value is zero. And whenever the P value is zero, it simply means that the two variables are not just highly correlated but they are correlated significantly. In other words, the correlation is significant, whether it's negative or positive. In our case here, the correlation between price and quantity demanded is negative, as you can see. It's negative 0 0.87. Okay. We know that the correlation is negative. Uh, is it significant? Yes, it is significant because the p-value is less than 5%. We know this that whenever the p value is less than alpha, 
in this case, 5% or 1% or 0.1%, then that relationship is significant. So you can do that. You can do even the last one here. For example, if you look at C, RC here against RN, okay, the value here tells you that the correlation between them is almost zero. And so that variable of negative 0.53, which is 53%, relationship negative, it is not just negative, but it's significantly negative. So that's what it means. So the p-value guides you to establish, you know, confidence interval on your results that you have generated. So it's important to know the interpretation of this because you will have several data sets where you will have to generate these things and come out with your know, information. All right, any question before we go to the next one? Any question before we go away from? Yes, Martin. Martin, go ahead. Hello, sir. Sorry, sorry. I think I, 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 I missed the mapping the, uh, the p values with the, the correlation coefficient. Okay, okay, okay. So I can repeat that for you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, I'm grateful. So what I'm saying is that if you pick a particular variable, okay, so let's say that I pick the relationship between M and C. Watch how they meet. This is C, okay, and then this is M, all right? And the value where they meet is 0.71. Okay. So you know that 0.71 is the relationship between M and then what? And then C. M is actually income. C is complement price. The relationship is 0.71, which means that they are quite, quite, quite related. They are 71% related. That's what it means. They are 71% associated with each other. If both of them are independent variables, as we shall see later in the next regression, then we have to check possibility of multicollinearity. And we'll do that using several tools like variance inflation factor. But the key point is that they are highly correlated. That's what I see here. That's what you see there. But the question is, is the correlation, is that positive? 0.71 correlation. Is it significant? That's the question. Is it significant? Now, to know whether it's significant, you have to come and check the p-value. The p-values are always at the bottom when you have generated them. So now I need to, to, to check the p-value between this very variable. Remember, it is C and M. I need to go to C here again and then match it against M here, as you can see. And what is the value? Well, as you can see, the value is zero. So the p-value is zero here. Wow. If it is zero, then what does that mean? It means that it is less than 5% alpha. Okay. And whenever the p-value is less than the level of significance, that's good news. Now we can conclude. In this case, we are rejecting the null of no correlation. And we are concluding that there is a correlation. And that correlation of 0.71 is significant. It's significant. So they are not just associated. You know, it's like saying that this woman and this child are related. But when, when you look at them, when you look at my baby, when you look at the person and you look at the, you say, well, look, there is no question. There is no question. This correlation has been further proven. How do you prove that? Because now a p-value is just, you know, solidifying the relationship. Okay. And then the p-value is, is, is zero, means that the correlation you had wasn't just a normal correlation, it was a significant. You can only use the word significant when you have, when you have a p-value. So that's okay. 
all these variables. So, so that means that now the null hypothesis is that. Go ahead. That means that. So the null the null hypothesis is that the the relationship is not the correlation is not significant. No, the null hypothesis is that there is no correlation. Okay. There is no correlation between the two. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. There is no okay. correlation between the two. Now, the alternative says that there is a correlation between the two. Yes. If we reject the null hypothesis, okay, then we are concluding that there is a correlation, but not just that there is a correlation, but it's significant. Okay. There's a significant correlation between these two variables. So for each variable, you can determine whether or not there is a significant correlation for each variable. Just check. For example, if I check this M and OT, the fact that the p-value is not zero, is 85%, means that whatever correlation you have between M and OT, look at the correlation. The correlation between M and OT was even negative 0.03. The correlation alone even tells you that it's small, okay? Uh-huh. But it's not all the time that when it is small, it means that it's bad. For example, look at the correlation between OT and RC. Look at the value. It is 0 0.05, right? Check the p-value. OT and, oh, wow, that is also bad. That is a clear indication that the correlation is insignificant. It has proven that, that it's insignificant. So that is one area. But look at the one below it. Look at the relation between OT, OT and RC, okay? OT and RC, the correlation coefficient is negative 0.43, this one, negative 0.43, okay? The question is, is that significant? Well, when you come and check the p-value, the p-value is almost zero. So yeah, it is, it is below 50% and yet it is significant, okay? So what this means is that there is a significant negative relationship between these two variables. Martin, I hope that, that explains you. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm grateful. Very good. So whilst you can use a graph, to just tell you that, this is the key point I wanted to do. The graph will just tell you that the correlation is negative or positive or neutral. That's all it could tell you, that's all. So what I've just circled is negative. The one I've just circled is positive. Okay. The one I've just circled here is more negative. The one I've just circled there is more positive. Okay. Uh, as you can see, this one here, is negative. So it will just tell you whether it's negative or positive or negative or positive or neutral. Negative or positive, negative or positive or neutral. The graph will just tell you that. Okay. Now the correlation will also tell you the value, not just negative, but how negative, the strength of the relationship. Oh, it is 70% negative. It is 40% negative. It's 50% positive. The correlation will tell you. But the correlation with the p-value, that, that one, it will tell you and it will also tell you that it's significant or it's not significant. I hope you guys can get it. So that one is deeper. That one is stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, at this stage, we have come to the end of descriptive statistics and correlation. You should be able to find several relationships between variables using the scatter plot matrix, the correlation matrix, or the correlation matrix with p-values. You should be able to use this to guide you in all of this. I wanted to start the topic on regression. However, if I start now, it will be too plenty in your mind. So I'm just going to hold on and then when we meet next time, I'm going to start on regression. Because remember, correlation deals with association between variables. Regression deals with causality. Mm -hmm. 
correlation doesn't tell you that. You know, correlation will tell you that there is a relationship, 80%, whatever percent relationship between price and quantity. There is a strong relationship there. But it's not telling you whether the quantity is causing the price to go up or the price is causing the quantity to go down. Regression will do that. Regression checks causality. Correlation checks association. Take a note of that. So you can just say that two things are associated without necessarily saying that one was causing the other to behave the way it is. No, okay. That one is done by regression. Regression establishes causality. And regression looks at cause and effect. Okay. Correlation looks at relationship. So now that we've gotten there, but usually the possibility, not all cases, when, when a variable is highly correlated, the possibility that one is causing the other to behave. But the question is that we don't know which one is causing the other to behave. It could be that the A is causing B to behave or B is causing A to behave. Or A causes B to behave and B also causes A to behave. But regression will establish all of that. So next time we are going to look at regression, oh, you are going to love it. So since I've given you the, I'll give you a slice, look at it, then we'll start um, with that.